So I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, latest uh, Merton seminar. Um, obviously, very glad to have you uh, with us today. Uh, our speaker today is uh, one of our own um, from, from physics, Professor Michael Weissman from, from Illinois. Um, Mike got his uh, AB in mathematics from, from Harvard uh, a while back. He worked summers at the Washington University in St. Louis in botany. Then he went on to UCSD, where he got a PhD in biophysics, and he postdoc in chemistry at Harvard. And then he joined the faculty at Urbana-Champaign in physics, uh, which is where I, I met him when I was a postdoc there myself, uh, mainly working on kinetic matter physics uh, using he was Mr. Noise. Uh, if there was anything, any random fluctuation, then Mike knew how that worked and, and how to get uh, information out of it and had a wonderful scientific career uh, doing exactly that. Uh, he says his one character flaw is that he compulsively writes PRL comments, etc. And you can I didn't use say it. just one. I said one of. <laughs> one of. <laughs> In any event, this Among, this is amongst his many character flaws. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. And this talk is 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 uh, is testimony to the fact that if you have a character flaw, sometimes you can make a living out of it. Also, um, then he does other things, as, as I think I might have uh, uh, noted in the in the announcement that we sent out. That you know, in his retirement, he's helped bust two fake pollsters using uh, forensic statistics. Um, he he does he, he really is very knowledgeable in statistics, which comes uh, partly out of uh, having married a statistician, and, um, and so he's very. Clued in, and his friends include uh, you know, really some of the best people in the field. So we're very fortunate today to, to have him with us. And what he's going to do for us is to tell us about this um, one piece of work on um, which has been widely cited and, and widely uh, you know sort of uh, used in discussions on the utility of GREs in this case for predicting program completion by Casey Miller et al. What this is going to be is, is one of these talks where he will explain to us, the, take us through the paper and sort of educate us on the pitfalls uh, of being naive about statistics to which the physicists are prone uh, despite our considerable self-regard when we, when we do such things. So just to remind you, um, the rules of the game are we record the main talk. Uh, we will stop recording when we come to the question and answer session. During the main talk, uh, you're welcome to ask questions which are of a technical nature, such as I didn't understand X. Uh, any discursive questions or uh, argumentative ones, of course, we discourage purely argumentative ones that can be postponed, uh, should be postponed to the question and answer time. Uh, you can, I believe, raise your hand, uh, uh, or you could maybe, that's best, um, and then I'll notice that you're there and, um, and call upon you at the appropriate uh, point where, where Mike has a break. So with that, I would ask Mike to start, although we just lost the screen share. Did we lose Mike also? Uh, oh, Mike. Yeah, I was, I, I seem to lose everything briefly, but am, is it working now? No, the, the screen share stopped, so you have to scroll. Okay, well, that's easy enough to fix. Okay, well, let's, let's hope that doesn't happen much more. Um, good. So uh, as Shivaji said, this is not going to be one of those broad surveys of an area like you've had in some of the previous talks. This is really gonna be a case study of the type of social science that physicists do and accept and shouldn't. Um, and what I want to, do in the talk is focus on the technical aspects of um, you know, how to treat these statistics. I'll drop a few little hints about where it would, would be nice to go in the discussion about talking about what the acceptance of this sort of work means for us as a culture. And I have very little to say about GRE policy, though I assume people will want to talk about that afterwards, but 
I'll just be a participant, you know, another participant in, in that rather than having anything special to say. Uh, so, by the way, please uh, interrupt with any technical points. If I don't pick up, you know, a flag going up or something like that, just unmute, unmute yourself and uh, jump in. Uh, on the more cultural side and certainly on the policy side, let's hold off until uh, the question and answer discussion afterwards. Okay, so a couple of years ago, a paper came out that got an enormous amount of publicity. I have a little sampling of some of that publicity here, claiming there's no correlation between the physics GRE test and graduation, that it fails to identify students, that it uh, doesn't have any significant effect on PhD completion in contrast to some other indicators and so on. This came out in Science Advances it was based on a large data set, 4,000 students. It was funded by four NSF grants. Uh, the senior author was a director of the American Physical Society. Uh, so it was taken seriously. Two of the authors are currently on a panel organized by the National Academies that uh, is preparing policies on issues of this sort. So um, what do they actually say in this article? They say that typical uh, PhD admissions criteria limit access to underrepresented groups that fail to predict doctoral completion. And that the weight of evidence in this paper indicates that lower than average scores on admissions exams do not apply a lower than average probability of earning a, P a physics PhD. So the GREs, are metrics that do not predict PhD completion. Very unambiguous uh, conclusions. And we're, we're gonna investigate how well those are justified by the data. First of all, why, why do they say they're doing this? They point out that there are demographic differences in the typical performance on both the GRE quantitative test and the GRE physics test where um, uh, essentially blacks and Hispanics have a lower mean, lower range on both tests, uh, Asians somewhat higher, um, some difference between males and females. And so they say that's the reason for uh, wanting to get rid of the test. They also, you know, if you uh, whoops, increase enrollment in some groups, um, that implies Oops, uh, decreasing enrollment in others, and they uh, are very clear as to which group they want to decrease enrollment in. Uh, they say the GREs are unfairly favor international students. So if you're in the targeted group, they're, they're giving you a warning. Now, before I talk about the paper itself, I wanna give you a little idea of the background of where the folks who wrote the paper are coming from. Casey Miller has been on this topic for a while and he makes a claim, he's made it in at least four publications and I think about two dozen presentations at different universities that overall PhD completion rate in US STEM graduate programs is a disappointing 50% these practices are no better than a coin flip at identifying candidates with the potential and the metal to earn a PhD. And he illustrates that in these talks with a picture of a coin flip. One of the talks was given at a you know, big APS thing. I think it still can be obtained from the APS website, which is where I got this picture. So let me ask a question. Any thoughts on this logic? If only about half the people that get into STEM graduate programs are actually ending up graduating with a PhD, does that mean that our um, admissions procedure is about as good as a coin toss? So I'm looking for responses. I'm on strike until some people respond. I mean, you can either say yes or no. Alexio said no. Uh, and uh, any explanation? 
Uh, David Campbell says no. Xiaoliang says no. Well, if one of you would like to speak, I will. Alexios, would you like to? Uh... Uh, yes, certainly. If we collect uh, the group of applicants that a typical school has, or our school, CUNY, has, and we just throw darts and pick the ones that we want, we would have a success rate much lower than 50%. The, <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense. What should I explain? Exactly, exactly. Uh, the, the, the very point. What, what is the selection process doing? It's changing the odds ratio um, for PhD completion and for other things. Let's just stick to PhD completion compared to what it would have been if we'd used a random acceptance. So what the selection process is doing is multiplying that random odds by some factor to get the actual odds we observe. What that factor is actually depends on the denominator. So if, for example, someone said, I have a treatment and 50% of the people that get this treatment will survive five years. And somebody says, is that, no, that's only half the people. That's just like a placebo. Well, if the pre-existing condition is pancreatic cancer, it's a pretty damn good treatment. If the pre-existing condition is teenage acne, it's not a good treatment. So, you know, this is this level, the point is this level of logic has made it through multiple pu publications, including Nature, um, multiple presentations to scientists. And as far as I can tell, nobody has objected and said, you know, that's crazy. Why don't you do this right? Um, so that's just a little hint as to where sort of heading on the sociology of this. So, okay, now on to the paper. What, are, what question are they trying to answer? Well, let's look for their words. Our goal here was not to identify the best predictive model with the minimum number of parameters, but rather to understand how all four commonly used admissions metrics and the most salient demographic information would contribute to a discussion of metrics and diversity by admissions committees. Is that clear? Okay, so to me that's word salad. And that means that you have to actually read the paper and try and construct your own coherent question. Um, but again, it says something about our culture. Stuff like that is published uh, in an important paper and nobody seems to notice. But if you look at what the paper's, paper's really trying to do, they're looking for whether dropping the GRE components of the admissions criteria would give lower degree completion. That is, the treatment would be drop GREs and the outcome that you're looking for is PhD completion. PhD completion doesn't seem like the world's most important measure, but to be fair, it's one that you can measure objectively, easily, quickly. So they have a reason to, do, to use it. Now, the way you usually answer a treatment outcome uh, question is by doing a randomized controlled trial. You randomly pick some and give them the treatment and others the alternative treatment. But that wasn't possible because basically everybody, all departments were committed to using uh, GREs in the admissions procedure. In fact, since at the time this started, essentially all departments did use them. You couldn't even do a sort of pseudo randomized trial but using modern causal methods. So they reasonably did something else. They tried to make a model of what measurable factors cause de degree completion. And if you make a model like that, you can make a sort of reasonable inference as to which factors you ought to pay attention to in deciding who to admit to your program. So, so far, uh, although we have to convert their nominal purpose of the paper into coherent English, so far, I'm with it. Um, how do they do that? Well. They take a bunch of factors like undergraduate GPA, various GREs, 
uh, demographic factors and so on, and put them in a standard linear logistic regression model. And the idea is you try to predict the uh, probability of graduation from a linear model of the log of the odds of the probability. And you can see the odds is just the ratio of the probability of graduating to one minus the probability of graduating. Uh, you express that odds by a Fermi function, e to the L over one plus e to the L. And you try to write L as a linear function of these various predictors. You know, none of this is some sort of rigorous thing, but it's a very standard method. And the idea is that if you look at the coefficient in the linear expression for this L uh, of any one factor like GREs or say GRE physics, that coefficient tells you how much that counts when you hold all the other things in the model constant. So if you are trying to separate sort of causal effects of various different factors, you want to hold the others constant and this uh, linear logistic regression model lets you do that. You look at these coefficients of each of the suspected causes. So that's you know, all very standard uh, way of approaching a problem like this. Now um, they, we start looking at their actual uh, results. The, uh, here are some of the factors they consider, undergraduate GPA, quantitative GRE, verbal GRE, physics GRE, uh, these demographic factors like non-US citizen, female, male is the default here, um, and so on. White is the default uh, ethnic category uh, in this model. And then there's these two things that are a little strange, tier one and tier two. What are those? Uh, what those are is uh, the rank of the graduate program. Tier one is the highest ranked graduate program and tier two is the medium ranked graduate program. Tier three is the lower ranked and that's the default. Now it's a little odd to see the rank of the graduate program that somebody ends up in is part of a predictive model because when somebody applies to your school, you don't say, hmm, did they go to Princeton for graduate school? Uh, that's, you know, we usually work with causal approaches where we take into account the past and not the future. So uh, that's a little bit strange in there, but um, we'll come back to discuss what that's doing in there, whether it should be or not uh, later. But meanwhile, let's look at the actual factors that could be used in predicting who will graduate. So we won't count tier. You can't count where somebody's going to go in the future for predicting whether you ought to take them into your uh, program. So we'll look down this, this list and see how many stars the different predictors have. Stars are a abbreviation for whether the P, what the p-value is, that is, if that predictor had absolutely nothing to do with anything and you just picked up a signal by random chance in the people that were looked at, how unlikely would it be to get an effect as big as the one that showed up in this sample? Uh, one star means less than 5% likely, Two star means less than 1% and three star less than a tenth of a percent. It's, I don't particularly like that way of presenting data, but again, it's very conventional. Um, and so you look down this list of things that are neither in the future nor just sort of generic fitting parameters that are shared by all students. And only one of them gets two stars, GRE quantitative. So at this point you go, you know, what the fuck? They told us that uh, the GREs were no good, that they weren't predictors. They just presented data, which in their own table, if you look at in any halfway conventional way, tells us the GRE quantitative 
is the most significant predictor of all the ones that they looked at. So in some sense, we're done here in dealing with this paper, but I can't resist going on. Um, yeah, by the way, remember, please interrupt if uh, anything seems puzzling at some point or objectionable or whatever. Um, Can I ask one thing? Just so yeah. this, so the, I guess the tier one tier two, the thing you're saying is you admit somebody to a graduate program and it's a little odd to be saying, well, the graduate program itself is a, is a causal factor in whether they complete. But is it to give them, I mean, is it somehow meant to be a proxy for the difficulty of the? Uh, well, there are ways in which the graduate program could be a genuine causal factor in whether they graduate. For example, Princeton could be harder than Arkansas State and mm -hmm. therefore make it harder to graduate. Princeton could fund much better than Arkansas mm -hmm. State and therefore make it easier to graduate. So mm -hmm. those are, if you're actually making purely a model of factors causal to graduation, uh, it might belong in there, but it's not one of the factors that um, anyone, and we're gonna talk in more detail about that. Why, why, don't yes. they, why don't they use historical data? We have historical data, what fraction of people graduate, very accurate. That, that's definitely. Well, well, in a sense, they, this, this is historical data on what fraction of people graduate. Uh, you know, they have an N of about 4,000. So, and it was gathered over a number of years. So you can think of this as a nicely, as nicely tabulated historical data itself. And uh, the issue, of course, if you want to compare graduation rate in different tiers is, are the different uh, graduation rates in the different tiers because they're getting really different students or are they because, you know, funding or ease of program is having a direct effect? And that's actually, it's not a question we can give a definite answer to, but if we get time at the end, I'll, I'll give, show how their data uh, suggests an answer to that. Uh, so, uh, in fact, it's related to what I'm about to mention here. If you look at the various predictive factors, now if you look at the um, underrepresented minority groups, they get, very uh, substantial negative logins. In other words, members in a given program, members of the underrepresented groups, even when matched on GRE and GPA to members of the highly represented groups, still have a substantially lower graduation probability. These are each approximately minus log two. So the odds of graduation are approximately a factor of two worse even after you've matched for program, test scores, and GPA. And we're gonna come back to what that means uh, mainly for the model, not for the students. They also say that when separately as analyzing samples of US females and US males, we see no differences in PhD completion probabilities as a function of any of the GREs. And that's uh, these things over here, US female, US male, and they don't get any stars for any of the GRE effects. Uh, but if you look at the overall uh, predictive ability of the GREQs, quantitative ones, remember we saw those were highly significant overall. And even in the US, they're highly significant. Furthermore, if you look at US females, it's a larger value in the US female or the point estimate than it is overall. Now, for, but there aren't very many females, so the error bars are big. So they say, well, it's not significant. We don't see anything. There's no difference. Uh, for the last six years or so, I've been, my hobby has been statistical consultants for the local medical residents who read it journal paper every month and need help in understanding them. Routinely, the efficacy of some new treatment is presented as some sort of, say, uh, odds ratio. Uh, 
overall in the overall group of people studied. And then they do a breakdown into males, females, Asians, blacks, blah, 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 um, you know, high blood pressure, low pressure. They do a breakdown into all these subgroups. And very typically, a large fraction of the subgroups don't show significant effects. They don't say, well, it doesn't work in them. What they do, the, you do the breakdown in the subgroup to see, hey, is there some sign that it's really different for some subgroup than the others? Because we should watch out for that. You don't take some group where it looks like the treatment works better than in the others, but because it's a small subgroup, say, I guess it doesn't work in that. So this is really a, a bizarre way of doing statistics here, bizarre way of treating subgroups. But it gives them the result that they want, which is to say GREs are no good. Mike, there's a question from uh, Oleg oh. Chernichov. Uh, yes, I'm not seeing the question, so just. Yeah, yeah, I will. Oleg, why don't you unmute yourself and just ask? Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure I understand the significance of GREQ. The number for it seems to be what uh, 1.3 times 10 to the negative two in the first column. Yes, uh, it took me a few days to find out what those numbers meant because they gave them and it turned out the place where they said what units those were in was occurred two page later. So <laughs> um, my, my son had to help me find out what, <laughs> what the numbers meant. Um, they're using percentile as the uh, unit for the GREs. So um, the range in principle is one to a hundred. So when you get these coefficients, which are roughly 10 to the minus two, that's saying if you go from low percentile to high percentile, it's a pretty big effect because it's, it's in units, there's a hundred percentiles. No, that, that still would be 1% or something? No, no, percentile, this would be, take a hundred times 13 times 10 to the minus three, that's 1.3. So that would be a log, a log odds of 1.3, which would be what, what a factor of 3.2 or something in odds. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, GPA is given in like, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So those units, it's easy to look like you have a bigger coefficient, even if it doesn't amount to as much. So that pre that's somewhat of a tendentious presentation feature, but you know, Ultimately, you can figure out how to read it. Good question. Okay, so now let's try and figure out whether GREs are important and significant. Though at first glance, they look fairly important there. So this is a, now a statistics lesson. Let's say you want to predict people's height from things. I don't know how big their belt is and you've got their shoes and maybe their shirt or some things. You wanna to put together stuff like they have to estimate their height, maybe some, doing some forensics. So you make some sort of linear model in terms of those things and you include shoe size. Let's say that you include both shoes. What does that do to the coefficient of shoe size in your thing? Well, first it approximately divides it by half because you've broken up the shoe coefficient into two pieces. And then it really cranks up the standard error of your estimate of the coefficient of each one because the model doesn't give a shit which shoe you're using. You could use three left shoes and minus two right shoes or something. That all looks good. So it puts huge error bars on your estimate of the coefficients. So even if shoe is a really good predictor, by the time you include the two shoes, if you compare each one's coefficient with its error bars, now they look insignificant. But that does not mean you should drop both shoes. If you drop both shoes, you're losing information. Excuse uh, me. Are you implying that if you include two variables that are completely correlated with each other, suddenly the model will start giving totally different results? No, the model will give the results, the same results in its predictions. It'll just tell you that, it, that the coefficients on each of those variables are insignificant even though the combination of the variables is giving you exactly what you would have gotten if you only included one of the variables. And uh, can you tell us why the error bars would increase in that case? Because sure, the model has no, as I said, has no particular preference to 
tripling the coefficient on the right shoe and using minus two times the coefficient on the left shoe. It gives the same result. It's one shoe coefficient. I see. So yeah. the, the two coefficients are correlated, but you see them both having huge uh, uh, variations. Exactly. Okay. Now, okay. Um, including GRE physics and GRE quantitative is not as bad as including two shoes because they're correlated, but not so perfectly. Uh, you can see that there's some effect of this going on because you can calculate what the uncertainty would be in these slopes uh, in their model if you just were taking one variable and predicting graduation probability and all their uncertainties are roughly twice as big as those would be. So that tells you there's some of this business of blowing up the uncertainty due to parallel collinear uh, predictors. And in fact, if you think about GRE quantitative and GRE physics, you'd expect them to be pretty highly correlated. I guessed for uh, calculational convenience, one over root two, and after a little badgering, managed to get the number for, from ETS, the test company, it was 0 0.707. And they said, how did you know? But, um, uh, so they're, they're highly correlated. And including two highly correlated variables for exactly these reasons can convert a significant predictor to a pair of insignificant, quote, insignificant, statistically insignificant predictors. So um, I wanted to know in their data, what were the um, correlation coefficients between these uh, variables? And fortunately, they wrote in their paper that all the data you need to evaluate the conclusions are present and you can request additional uh, data. In fact, in order to publish in a AAAS journal, you have to sign this pledge that you will meet any reasonable request for um, auxiliary data to help in exactly this type of um, issue. And when I published, I became aware of that when I published my critique of their paper, realizing, well, you really have to pledge to be good about sharing your data. So I wrote them say, you know, these covariance matrices um, are important to know how to interpret these data. Could, you know, thanks in advance for your help in sending it and got back. Thanks for your interest. I uh, can't share it because human subjects. Like, you know, what the fuck? I'm asking for one correlation coefficient on 4,000 um, you know, students. That's going to reveal something to me about their lives that's inappropriate for uh, human subjects. So that was how they dealt with that request. Um, then um, Dan Erevis asked if I could say something about the American Physical Society having considered a proposal on GREs that was based very directly on this paper and came close to passing, except I threw a prolonged fit, email fit expressed to many other people over a course of a few months saying, this is gonna be a really embarrassing disgrace if we base a policy on this paper. And it was then voted down and the day or two after it was voted down, they said, oh, okay, we'll give you some of those. Um, some of those uh, correlation coefficients. And so those were then published in, a, in the archive. They're lower than the bare APS ones for a reason called range restriction, which I'll discuss later in another context. But the point is now you have two predictors, which you can think of as vectors. Uh, they're not quite parallel, but you can put them together and say, what if I act like a normal department and make a decision that inv involves both the GRE quantitative and the GRE physics um, predictors, I you combine them to get an overall predictor the way most people have been doing. Uh, how do you combine them? Well, a reasonable way would be to make their, um, give them the same overall weight. One of them has more range than the other. So you have to give a little extra weight to the one that has narrower range so they're gets ends up getting equal weight in the overall predictor. This is, this is just sort of details. The point is you can combine them 
in this equilate form and get what is the predictive effect as you go from say the 10th percentile to the 90th of the GRE physics combined with the GRE quantitative um, uh, test results on the odds of graduating in the US uh, in, in these physics programs, PhD programs. And you get a net logit effect of 0.72. That is a little more than a factor of two in odds. If you compare that with the effect that they report for GPAs, that was about 0.6 in the US. So not only is this worth paying attention to, it's actually bigger than the GPA effect, which they, where they said the opposite. They said that the GPA effect was big and, and the uh, GRE effect was negligible. What's even stronger, which you can always go back and check their table is that the GPA effect gets wiped out as you include the international students. Uh, the, the, it's just uncalibrated. And, and so you lose about a factor of two in the GPA effect, whereas the GRE effect doesn't really change in the international group. So that overall, there's no question that the GRE combination, physics and quantitative, is much better in the overall set than it is, than is the, uh, the GPA, which is the other actual predictor that's used. And if you ask, what about, um, what about statistical significance? Well, because the standard error of the combination loses the, you know, the shoe effect, the extra variance that you get because they were so correlated, it turns out that the net effect of the GREs is about 4.5 times the standard statistical error in their data. So that's way over the usual two statistical error cutoff that's used for quote significance. Um, it's way into the significant range and it's better than GPAs. So for those who want to know what facts do you need to know about GREs as predictors, uh, when you go on to make your policy decision, um, we're done. But that's actually not the main thing I'm interested in here. I'm mainly interested in the level of bullshit that smart physicists are willing to put up with when you slightly leave ordinary physics and go to what amounts to being social science. Well, they give a, um, a nice visual presentation of how much GREs, GR, GPAs, and so on are telling us about the students. They give the, uh, for the 10th percentile, the median and the 90th percentile in the US group, males and females, what the predicted probability of graduation is. Now this is on a, su a set of 2,300 students data. And I looked at this as what? This is the median student here, median on everything else. And now we pick the middle one that's median on the GRE. And they're telling us that if you take a bunch of those students, you don't really know whether 80% are gonna graduate or 50% when you've taken data on 2,300. I turned to my wife and made a wisecrack. I said, maybe by the 10th percentile, they mean ha ha like the 10th percentile, not including the people in the ninth percentile or the 11th percentile. Uh, and after looking at the paper for two weeks, I realized that wasn't a joke. That's what they'd done. Um, so this was a truly creative thing to do. If we had a different number of fingers, so we were counting in something other than percentiles, those error bars would have all been different. Um, hey, so, could you just emphasize that point once more? Okay, when they, were, they give these huge error bars on like how uncertain you are when you take a, say a median student and try and estimate whether, you know, a bunch of those median students are gonna graduate. Is it gonna be 10% of them, 100% of them? So how do you know? You try and estimate from the data you've got. And they, what they do by median student out of 2,300, they honest to God, they look at a set of those say between 49.5 percentile and 50.5 percentile. They look at those 23 students. And yeah, then you get really big error bars, but that's not how 
anybody in real life would do it. I know it sounds like a joke. It was a joke when I first told my wife. I finally convinced myself this is how they did it. I wrote it in the critique in Nature, uh, in, in Nature, in Science Advances, and they did not deny that that's what they did. Uh, you know, in other words, like you take a huge amount of data and you arbitrarily pick one tiny little fragment out of it and say, well, looking at that, I don't know. That's what they did. And again, uh, what, what, what should they have done? Should they have taken, say, from the 70th to the 90th percentile for the 80 figure? No, they, they, have, they, they, they should have done exactly what they did in the, um, the table for the median. Uh, right at the median, they have error bars on, you know, well, it, it wouldn't be quite be the intercept, but something like the intercept. That's the error bars. They, with 2,300 students, you can calculate exactly what the um, error bar should be, which I've done here. Mm -hmm. If they, you lump them all together, they should be plus, plus or minus 2%, 95% confidence. Thanks. Um, now, out here, you get additional error bars because there's error bars on the slope, which is the only thing you're interested in. And so the error bars out here for the low scores and the high scores would be a little bigger than the error bars for the median because they include both the median error bars plus a bit of this, some slope error bars. And that's of course what you're interested in. So this figure is kind of irrelevant, but it's also dishonest. And, you know, transparently wrong and they didn't really deny that. Okay, now we get to the actually um, interesting, uh, intellectually interesting part. Mike, Something there was a question from yeah. Cynthia uh, Rashad. I think she went in the chat. Yes, okay, I, I, I only see my screen, so. Yeah, um, yeah, no, oh. this is my job. Cynthia, could you unmute and ask? Uh, hello? Hi, Cynthia, can you? All right, I'll, I'll just read out her question. Uh, so what she says is, why would he, why would they do that? Did they want big error bars? Yes. Simple question, simple answer. Yes, <laughs> they want big error bars because they're trying to show that these things aren't predictors. Very good. He's okay. Good. So uh, let me go back to a paper from now, slightly changing topics, but this is actually the most interesting part. Uh, a paper from 1993 uh, on validity of the GRE without restriction of range. Because you notice, first of all, when you do these correlations, you're leaving out everybody who didn't get into graduate school. So you've restricted the range of people you're looking at. Furthermore, when you divide those who did get in into three different tiers, top tier, middle tier, bottom tier, you're restricting the range in e within each of those tiers a whole lot more. What does that do to those predictive coefficients? Well, this paper from 1993 on what happens when you restrict the range, specifically of the GRE in predicting things, comes to the conclusion, these these results support the conventional argument that uncorrected GRE validity, validity estimates um, on range restricted samples are strongly biased towards zero. In other words, by 1993, that was already the conventional argument. And this paper showed very strong data confirming it. And nowhere in this paper uh, that we're discussing now is there any hint that this is even an issue. Um, if we have time later, I'll discuss how they managed to do this magic experiment in 1993. Um, see, uh, meanwhile, what was there any way physicists should know about this? Yeah, Alex Small at uh, Cal Poly had published in the, uh, on the archive a warning to people trying to do things like this, specifically on this um, issue said, so let's simplify, do a toy model where there's only two things used to admit students. One is GRE and the other is research experience. And so the higher the GRE, the more research experience, the better. So quality goes this way. 
now different schools um, admit you know, different levels of students. So let's look at a sort of mid-tier school here and the students they admit. The, these guys went off to Princeton or someplace. These ones didn't get admitted anywhere, but these got admitted to, I don't know, University of Indiana or something. Um, there's a very narrow range of quality in there. So if you try to estimate um, how well does GR, within that program, how well does GRE predict quality and say it, it's negligible. I mean, look, everybody here is almost the same quality, even the ones with low GRE or the ones with high GRE. That's because you're forget, you can't control for research experience because you don't have you don't have that as part of your tabulated database. They couldn't include all those other factors that are used in admissions because they're not standardized from school to school and they're not simple and quantitative. Do those other factors exist? And if so, how would they know they exist? Well, there was a paper a few years in 2017 whose senior author was actually the senior author of the paper we're discussing that tabulated what factors are used in physics graduate school admissions. And all these ones with blue arrows like research experience, uh, letters of recommendation, blah, 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 are used almost everywhere and um, are outside their model so you can't control for them. And so when, if you find somebody that did really well at the GRE but didn't go to a very good school, that's probably because they were low on the other predictors. Or if they had poor GRE but got into a good school, that's because they were high on the other predictors. So of course you sort of cancel out the predictive uh, ability of GRE or GPA or anything else that's in the model. That's called stratification bias. And if that wasn't clear, you know, you can think of it. What if there's a couple of things, GRE and GPA, that are in your model, but out of your model is like research experience and letters. To get into Princeton, they all have to be pluses. You don't get much prediction there. To get into some mid-tier place, you can get away with one minus somewhere uh, out of the model or in the model, but not a lot. And again, that means that everybody who's in there is, is similar, so you don't see the predictive ability. Of, if you try to look in the, within this tier and figure out what the predictive ability of any one of these things is, it pretty much gets wiped out. Same in the low tier. And then as far as the people who didn't make it into the sample, they're not even in your sample. So uh, looking at these, it's bad enough leaving people out of the sample, but once you divide things into tiers, you really wipe out how, what the predictive effect of these various uh, uh, parameters was. So what does that mean? Yes, you can use data from a wide range of programs to try to estimate these predictive slopes, or you, you might treat them as, as causal slopes. You're measuring something that actually helps cause somebody to graduate. But if you butcher the data by stratifying it into these little strata, you're going to wipe that out. So that's a well-known strategy for wiping out effects. And they went ahead and used it and didn't mention it. Even if you don't deliberately stratify, it's very well known that simply leaving out the people who didn't make it into your sample uh, causes a big effect of this range of this type. And you would probably, even if you weren't trying to stratify, underestimate the predictive coefficients just because of that limitation. If you look at uh, predictive slopes in any one program, which is even narrower than a tier, it's like a hyperfine tier instead of a fine tier, uh, you're almost always gonna find that there's very little leftover predictive ability of any of the things you used in your admissions decision. If there is much predictive ability left, uh, well, and, and now you can take a whole bunch of those programs and average them all. Just take the predictive coefficients in UIUC and Princeton and Indiana and Arkansas State, blah, blah, blah. Average the predictive coefficients in all of them. And guess what? That does nothing to remove this selection bias. All you're doing is averaging a bunch of incorrect slope estimates. 
So what is left after you've done this highly stratified selection, what's left of the predictive coefficients is well, a little bit of bleed through because the selection is not so ultra precise, but mainly it's, it's a it tells you the, the leftover coefficients tell you how you should adjust your admissions criteria. You could easily get some criterion which gave a negative slope because you're counting it a little bit too much. Or you could get a criteria that gave a pretty positive slope which says mm, you're counting it you know, somewhat too little if, if graduation was your only goal, which it isn't. So let me now just uh, prepare you for other things, not in this talk, but in life, uh, and make a little bit of a causal cartoon we're looking at an outcome, PhD, and we're looking at a bunch of proxies for different causes, GPAs, GREs, whether you're in an underrepresented minority and various out of, out of model predictors. We're pretty sure that um, GREs, GPAs, and the out of model predictors and the way they're used in admissions all have positive causal effects on PhD completion probability. GPA, GRE, um, and out of model predictors, hopefully in this sign they're used, all have positive uh, predictive uh, coefficients for what program you get, the rank of the program you get into. Furthermore, you know, we all know that being in an underrepresented minority, we all give that a positive predictive uh, coefficient for getting into a good program. So some of these coefficients we know, some like, is there any direct effect of being an underrepresented minority on PhD? We don't know. Uh, could be positive, could be negative. You know, there could be financial issues. There could be the department trying to do its best to help out. If there's an effect, we don't know what its sign is. Um, is there an effect of program rank on getting a PhD? Well, we don't really know that either because you know the better programs are better funded, but have harder tests, so who knows? Um, but what we would know is that you expect, this is called the collider. All of these different causes collide on this variable. They all have a, an effect on it. And that's why this type of stratification that we've been discussing is called collider stratification bias. So when you see those words, as you will often, um, that's what it's about. And what would, the, what would be the sign of the collider uh, stratification bias here? Well, maybe being in an underrepresented mi a minority doesn't have much of a direct effect on being a PhD. We saw in their model, it looks like it has a big negative effect. Why would that be? Well, we, we strat they stratified on program rank. And we saw that there should be negative collider stratification bias because of these out of measure, out of um, model uh, pre predictors, we saw that there should be negative stratification bias uh, for the other predictors. So probably those negatives for the underrepresented minorities are just plain collider stratification bias due to their really shitty model. So that's all I'm saying here is now we look, now we can know enough to look back and say these terrible looking negative logits here are probably just plain bias from selection on a collider, namely the rank of the program. And it's the same bias that they use to underestimate the um, predictive slopes for GREs. So good. now just looking back, summarize. Here's what they did, the APS guy and the four NSF grants. They introduced extra collider bias without mentioning it. They introduced error bars. Uh, they inflated their error bars, bars by unnecessary collinearity and range restriction, by, you know, by not combining the GREs uh, and by adding those tiers. They misinterpreted what p-values means. If you miss significance on some group, it does not mean there's no effect. They used this really bizarre treatment of subgroups in order to find ones where they could find no effect. Despite promising that they would supply the data, they left out the covariance matrix. They wouldn't admit what the results were of a less stratified model and so on. They creatively invented a new way to multiply error bars by 10. 
And then finally, they took what came out to be their most significant predictor anyway and said it didn't predict. And every one of those errors supports their prior logical assertion that the sort of mediocre PhD graduation rate means that the admissions procedures are no better than coin toss, which fundamentally misunderstands statistics. And um, they presented a model which due to collider stratification said that being a URM member specifically predicted um, lower graduation probability even after you've controlled for GREs and GPA. And then after making that prediction, they said the problem was a bottleneck in the admissions procedure. So um, I have to give an epilogue, which is after a year of science advances, finding one excuse after another, they finally published my technical critique along with the lengthy response from Miller. And this is where the, at the point where I just say they're liars, not just that they're wrong. They said, okay, let's get rid of the tiers. And they replaced those narrow tiers with single programs. They removed the word tier, but they replaced their three tiers with 20 programs, that is 20 narrower tiers. And they said, see, it doesn't, you know, the effect still isn't there. They said that they needed the tiers because every program wants to use specialized criteria for their program. But those specialized things show up in interaction terms between the predictors and the program, not in the overall terms, not in the main effects. And they never gave any interaction terms. And now in their follow-up, they said, oh, and by the way, all the interaction terms were insignificant. Nonetheless, they had, well, so it was totally illogical. Um, they said, went through an argument as to why, you know, those variables weren't all that collinear. So there's no problem giving them separately. So nothing was significant, but they never commented on what actually happens if you combine the GREs to get rid of the collinearity and that you get a predictor that's better than GPA. They just did not respond to that. When they, on the question of what happens when you drop just one of the shoes, don't you see that the other one is significant? Instead of dropping GRE um, P, which was the less significant compared to GRE Q, they dropped the more significant one. And then despite the ultra, ultra stratification, they barely got GRE P to miss their you know, arbitrary significance criteria. So it could be they were so stupid that they didn't understand that they were, conceivably they were so stupid that they didn't understand that they were making the uh, collider stratification much worse here, but they couldn't have possibly been so stupid as to say that um, you should drop the more significant predictor rather than dropping the less significant predictor. So, but every, so everybody has forgotten about this stuff. Not exactly. The draft uh, statement, current draft statement of the APS includes a reference to this paper in the new version. So, you know, it's one of those, one of those things that won't go away. If, in case anybody's wondering, okay, this is just some physicist who's never had a stats course, you know, ranting, why should I believe it? I suggest looking at uh, an extremely well-known statistician, Andrew Gelman, uh, ran a blog about this debate. And Andrew and I did not see eye to eye. We had a little bit of an argument on his blog. He said, there are extremely stupid people who um, are just turned stubborn when, when their errors were pointed out to them. And I said, well, no, there are extremely stupid people who were dishonest. So, you know. There was a little bit of back and forth on that. And um, I suppose it's hard to give a definite answer to that. So here's some tentative take homes. Okay, you can read the abstract in some fancy peer reviewed thing and that does not mean you should believe it. That so many really smart physicists have accepted this stuff just says, wow, we need 
stats education free. Scientists, if they're ever gonna read anything even close to social science, like in education research, uh, when you raise questions, when you start giving answers, you should have actually well-defined questions, not like that word salad we read at the beginning. When you're trying to decide what you want to do, you better have causal questions that if I do this, what will that do to the outcome? That's called the counterfactual causal question. Uh, using, they use two different software programs that doesn't save you. And although they're arguing that cognition is unimportant and often in much of our work, it, it isn't. Sometimes it is, and boy, is this an illustration of one of those cases where it is. Uh, my wife keeps pointing out, you know, sometimes physicists, when they get outside real physicists, just think, oh, it's girly stuff. You know, doesn't matter what we say. And the reminder is, no, if, if you're gonna present something scientifically, use real science, even if you're not actually in the lab. And maybe, maybe I hope that if we quit publishing fake science of this type, it might incrementally help us um, be more believable when we talk about global warming, vaccines, things that really count. And uh, just a reminder of uh, words that Galileo put in the, that Brecht put in the mouth of Galileo, that this paper made me think of. And uh, onward to hopefully uh, a discussion of any leftover technical points and the cultural points about what does it mean when you know, our, our community, brilliant physicists, accept stuff that really, you know, to my statistician friends, this looks like people look to us when somebody does, you know, off the street comes in and says they figured out what's wrong with relativity or why global warming is all wrong. That's the level this looks like. Um, and we seem to keep doing it. So that's it. Great, Mike. Thank you so much. I'm now going to stop recording and I'll stop from screen sharing so much so we can talk like people.